To start off the discussion, we are honored to be joined by Congressman Joe Garcia, who will be delivering today's keynote remarks. Congressman Garcia was born and raised in South Florida and was elected to the House of Representatives last November. His district, Florida's 26th, spans from West Miami-Dade to Key West. The Congressman serves on the House Judiciary Committee, including on the Immigration and Border Security Subcommittee. He also serves on the Committee on Natural Resources. Con Congressman Garcia has been a leading voice on the importance of commerce, on immigration border security, and on the impact of these issues on the nation, our economy, and our security. After a few brief remarks, we will turn quickly to audience questions and, and answers, and I hope to have an engaging discussion. Congressman, thank you for being here today. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's something of, of great import, uh, particularly in my uh, community. Um, you know, the, these uh, sequestration cuts, as we watch them, are a fascinating uh, political game being played. Uh, three weeks ago, everybody was against them uh, as they hit, and now the Republicans are for them. And since the world hasn't come to a crashing halt, it seems like everything's going to be okay. But that's rarely the truth when you deal with uh, long-term financial implications of such, uh, such cuts. No one disagrees that we need to be more efficient in how we manage government and how we need to achieve uh, the goal of reducing uh, spending. But I want to talk uh, specifically about uh, something in my district, which is Miami International Airport. This is the, basically the engine that drives my community. It is the ninth largest airport in terms of passengers. It is the first in terms of cargo. And it, in essence, keeps almost 250,000 people employed in the local community. Now, if any of you have traveled through my airport, it's, it's absolutely wonderful for those of us who know where we're going. Um, but it is, it, is, it is a wonderful airport, which has just spent a huge amount of money creating not only new terminals for American Airlines and their service towards Latin America, but has also created a brand new um, reception center uh, for, uh, for incoming international visitors. If you travel during non-peak times, it is a quite pleasant experience. However, if you arrive at peak times, it is reminiscent of uh, the last chopper leaving Saigon. Uh, uh, average wait times go for over three hours. Over a thousand people miss flights on a monthly basis, uh, connecting flights. In fact, we, we think the number is closer to 50,000. That's just not acceptable. And it's not acceptable in, in relation to what we're trying to do, which is border security. Remember, almost half of those folks who are in the country without documentation did not sneak across the border. They walked across or they flew in. And uh, we've come to a point where we're reaching a point of diminishing returns. $18.5 billion is being spent on border security. Um, while I'm, I'm someone who believes that border security is important, that is more than we spend on the FBI, DEA, and all other federal criminal law enforcement. So it is our belief that, uh, that as we as we look at this problem, we have to take into account the, the impact that it has broadly. So talked about the airport, now I'll talk specifically. 89%, just to give an example of my airport, of all the flowers in the United States come in through my airport. They come in through Colombia and Ecuador. It employs 7,000 people in the area around the airport, and it Nationally, that industry employs over a quarter million people. Small flower shops, which cannot work if we don't have our imports uh, throughout the country. Uh, uh, whole whole uh, sections of Walmart and Kmart, which are dedicated to such things. But it, it's important also the aspect or the feeling that one gets. Uh, most of this crowd seems to be old enough to have actually walked into a physical bank. Uh, there is nothing more uh, uh, troubling and when you enter a bank to cash a check or make a deposit at lunchtime and there are six teller windows and only two tellers open, you're, you're 
your mind immediately races to the four men and women in the back who must be having a sandwich at your cost. Well, that's how people feel when they enter our airport. We have 76 brand new reception areas for, for, uh, for uh, Customs and Border Patrol. And yet, we can't staff them even during peak times. So when you arrive to the airport, you see a brand new setup without the ability uh, to get through and, and with chaos breaking out. So uh, this is a real problem. And it's something that affects us, it affects our economy, uh, and, and it affects our ability to continue to grow. In the next, we hope, in the next six months, to get visa waivers. That, uh, our estimate is that will increase travel from Brazil alone by five-fold, which is already one of the leading tourist groups that come to our airport. If our airport is not able to receive them, they will go elsewhere. Uh, I'm not saying that going to Houston or New York is that bad, but I'd, I'd rather get them. So, you know, uh, <clears throat> I, I may be a, 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 a freshman at uh, 49, but, I, but I, I think most folks realize in Congress that we've got to get serious about these budget cuts and the sequester is a bad idea. Unfortunately, it's a bad idea which seems to be taking root as, as good action. Uh, it's not. We need to be smart, we need to be directed, we need to have a plan in place, and we haven't seen that. And uh, unfortunately, I think we're going to pay a price for it. Uh, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but in the long term, I think it will affect our country, our ability to be competitive, particularly areas like my community, which is which a huge percent of our economy is based on our neighbors to the south. So I hope that lays out my vision on it. So. Well. Thank you very much. Um, before we turn to audience questions, I actually have one of my own. Um, I'm a former um, House Armed Services Committee staffer, and seeing the role that annual legislation can play in, um, in supporting our military, I question whether we, we couldn't have a more structured process for legislative action on immigration, border control issues, economic issues. Can you talk a little bit about what you see coming on the horizon for legislative opportunities to address some of these issues? Um, or is sequester really just throwing up a roadblock that is going to um, prevent even thinking about other areas of legislation? I, I hope not. Uh, I, I think that, you know, to be quite honest, I don't think we're doing the heavy lifting in, in the subcommittee I'm a member of. We, we've uh, I want to say abrogated, but let's say we've delegated it to, to two bipartisan groups in each house that are working on a broader compromise. And it is a, a holistic compromise. Um, my hope is that the Republicans, uh, you know, when you hear me uh, speak publicly uh, to some degree, like I'm doing today, I, I try to hold to a very open view because I come from a, from a community which has a very open immigration system. You know, the, ba the, the core of our immigrants are Cuban-American. Uh, Cuban-Americans have uh, the Cuban Adjustment Act, which it makes their pathway uh, forward much easier, uh, much, much easier uh, uh, to solving uh, th their problem. And therefore, people invest and, and get adjusted and are in the community almost immediately. But my thinking is, uh, you know, I, I sit with colleagues that have been on this committee before, and they say, look, I know this sounds crazy to you, the sort of very focused enforcement and, and uh, high tech without, engage and, and without engaging the 12 million, right, the elephant in the room. Um, but my colleagues say, hey, this is much better. We were talking about electric fences before, right? So I, I think that I think most people get it. I think most Republicans understand that they are in a difficult place. I think they are making the tactical mistake of their lives by getting engaged in an argument about a uh, pathway forward. I want you to understand, my grandfather lived in this country almost 30 years. He was a bus driver in, in his native Cuba, and he was a lawn man when he was here in the United States. I, I was his assistant slash translator. And, uh, uh, he, he never did anything but get his residency, right? When he got his residency, you know, he had a sixth grade education. He 
wasn't about to take a, a history uh, test. Um, he, you know, he wasn't engaged in any high risk uh, uh, behavior. Therefore, he he didn't get stopped on a regular basis. He drove a tricycle to, towards the end of his life, so um, he wasn't worried that he was going to be stopped for anything. But the reality is that by making an argument about denying a pathway forward, what they are doing is leaving um, an open wound that will be played politically for a very long time, as opposed to fixing the problem. And you, you may be against what Reagan did, but in the end, uh, it had a huge impact on our, on our country. It, it, uh, it increased the salaries of working class and uh, middle class for five years in a row straight. Uh, it integrated a huge amount of folks into the workforce, and 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 it let us go forward. And the one thing that made it worse was the '96 Act, right? So it, you you may disagree with with what the what what we did, but the '96 Act is what made it worse because what it did is it le it didn't allow people to adjust after they had committed an infraction, and so almost five million of the folks of the 12 or 13 million are people who've committed an infraction of overstay, and they've got a visa waiting for them on the other side, but they can't go because if they go, when they touch back, they can't return. Uh, you know, I, I want you to put, put this in the context. There has never been a great country in history that doesn't have immigration. From the Babylonians to the, through the Romans to the British, if you are a world power, people come to you because you are the, you are the epicenter of what happens in the world. It brings you talent, it brings you ingenuity, it brings you opportunity. Does it have to be managed? Of course it does. Uh, and we've got, we've got to be strict about it. But the, the reality is that to, to sort of think that uh, we, have a, we have an immigration problem. No, you know, we'd have an immigration problem if we were having meetings about how we get more folks to come to America, how we figure out how to get people to pick our fields, because those are real problems in Europe. Uh, uh, where they they literally have to offer land and incentives to get people to come. Uh, we, I think, are in a privileged position. We get to pick, we get to have them, and we can control them. What we have broken is an immigration system that doesn't maximize uh, our ability to, to use this huge pool of talent that is offered to us from the high-tech side to the, to, the, to the agricultural worker. Thank you for uh, such yeah. a thoughtful response. Um, I'd like to turn the floor over to members of the audience for questions. Um, if you would, wouldn't mind waiting for the microphone, either Rob or uh, Ashley will come to you with a microphone. Please stand, state your name and your affiliation. Um, and if you could have a question mark at the end of your question, uh, we'd really appreciate it. So anyone with questions? <laughs> I think we have an under-caffeinated audience this morning. Yes. Um, well, let me turn to this question then, sir. You mentioned that the, um, the average wait time in, in Miami is, is three hours. And actually, I was going to raise the issue that I, I had to wait two and a half, but now I feel kind of lucky um, to get through the immigration During line. During peak times. I don't want to scare travelers <laughs> exactly. away. Peak times. Um, but any, any um, sense of relaxation I had from the Cayman Islands was I left it in Miami. Um, yeah. But if you could talk a little bit about um, the project that the airport underwent um, to modernize and to create a visitor center um, and what you think can be done to help leverage that facility now in, in terms of how can we get uh, CBP staffing? How can we, what, what are the steps, practical steps that should be taken to address these issues? Because it is frustrating to see empty kiosks uh, that could be processing people and cutting the wait times in half. Okay. We, we, we have to have a better relationship with who we're dealing with. Uh, you know, I, I often talk about what, why is it we can't figure out where, where uh, Pedro or John are in the United States. I, 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 get, a, I get in a plane, I fly to, to Bangkok, I, I take a cab, jump onto a canoe, and then buy a mango on a canoe for 15 cents. Both my card is, is, uh, doesn't leave or go anywhere else, and the 15 cents somehow find its way to my bill in Miami Beach, right? Why is it we can't uh, track a human being? Why is it that it's impossible for us to figure out what you're doing? Uh, I don't think it's that tough. I, I, you know, the other day I was with, um, with a group of farmers in my district. My district, uh, as you mentioned, uh, 
the, the center part of my district is the area called Homestead or Florida City. It is the most productive uh, acreage in Florida in terms of per acre um, of value. And so I'm sitting with farmers and I'm, you know, trying. Uh, one of the guys said, listen, we don't, the last thing you got to do is g give these folks a pathway forward because then they'll leave and not work at our farms, which was akin to slavery, but uh, he didn't mean it in a bad way. Um, <laughs> but uh, but when, when I was talking about it, I said, look, we, we have to figure out a, a system so we can document these folks. And all the farmers laughed. And, and, and I said, what did I say that's funny? And they said, well, they all have documentation. None of it's real, but they all have documentation. And of course, this is an absurdity, right? We're sitting, you know, we, we have technology that can do this. You know, you, you, you know, an iPhone can scan a card. We know who it is. There's only one card per person. We issue it to one person. There is a time for that person. There's a certain salary associated with that person. We're tracked where they're supposed to be. We can check where they are as opposed to all these phony documents that are going on. This is, you know, what it requires is government to cooperate with business. What it requires is to have a serious attitude that we're going to pay these people humane wages. Likewise, we, we have the world's greatest university system, which is, by the way, in a, in a huge portion being kept up with foreign students who pay the entire ride. Unlike when I went to college where a huge portion undeservedly was given to me for some kind of academic excellence. These folks come in and pay most of the ride. And they're studying in our universities, paying the whole way, and working in our businesses. We're realizing their talents, and then we're sending them home to compete with us. It's an absurdity when we could absorb them and put them in our, in our country. I, I had a, a large American uh, um, a computer um, um, computer language um, corporation who said to me, who, who came to us, a, a programming corporation, said to us, we have 30,000 jobs we cannot fill, even if we got every, every single person graduate. What an excellent opportunity. Now, by the way, they try to apply for these visas. They spend money on, on immigration lawyers to try to get these, these limited pot of visas. Why can't we charge them for having these folks come here, make sure they pay their health care, charge them a fee, take that fee, spend it in our community college system, spend it in our, in our STEM education, in particular areas where we want to see change. There's no reason for this. You know, it, it, it's very similar to, uh, you know, I mentioned the Romans before. You know, the Romans, after, every, after they had these huge battles where you conscripted large numbers of people, they'd return to the Senate and said, make these, give them land, which was akin to making them citizens. Because if you didn't, they were going to come into the Senate and take your jobs, right? And and to some degree, that's exactly what we're doing. You know, we have this huge argument about the our education system being broken K through 12. Yes, there has to be reform, but we wouldn't have the world's greatest university sitting on top of that if there wasn't a strong foundation that is producing some real talent. A talent that is bringing other talent from around the world to 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 benefit from that system, and uh, I'm a great believer that our immigration system is broken if it can't take this, and um, and and we make a huge mistake to our detriment, not to not to fix that system and to take the best and the brightest to call them out of those who who've come here, uh, and and believe it or not, they'd still keep coming um, uh, into the system. By the way, likewise, uh, on the ag side, I, I'm not someone to, to reduce the, the number of entries and continue a generous visa program for diversity uh, and family reunification. We, we can use it. This gentleman, please. Congressman David Olive. Uh, there's been some talk about using maybe retired customs agents or military retired military to handle peak time issues. There's also the program DHS calls one face at the border. But TSA, uh, I mean TSOs and customs agents not only don't uh, cross-pollinate their work, but their staffing models don't even talk to each other. It's also my understanding the administration and the, the employee unions are firmly opposed to having retired agents, even though they're maybe qualified, to handle the peak time issue. How would you address 
that issue and is that an idea that needs to gain some traction? But uh, good, I'm glad the mic was off there. Um, <laughs> No, I, I listen. I'll, I'll give you an example. Again, again, you know, one of the great things about my community is that the airport is right smack dab in the middle of the city. Right? When people say, "Oh, LaGuardia is right there in New York," no, Miami International Airport is right smack in the, and it's fascinating. The largest, the fastest growing city in our airport is a is a place where we literally wouldn't sell houses before because it was in the glide path of the airport, right? Which is Doral, which now is a a colony of Venezuela in our midst. Uh, Here's a fascinating thing. You can work in Miami International and be there almost almost from anywhere in the county in, in 20, 25 minutes, particularly on non-peak times, right? And so I don't understand why we can't negotiate with the unions, because I think most of the workers, at least in MIA, would think it a tremendous advantage. Now, the one part they don't get is their overtime pay. So. While Customs and Border are 24-7 at, at our airport, um, uh, USDA uh, inspections, again, our, our border is one of the, the largest in terms of perishable goods. They only work um, uh, Monday through Friday. They get massive overtime, no Saturday and Sunday work. So when, you, when, when these guys show up to the airport on Monday, there is a stack up of stuff that has to go out. It's a lost Labor Day for the folks who are pushing things out. No, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with you, and it's something that I think industry has to push more aggressively. Um, it, it, it has to be fixed. We no longer live in a, in a, in a five-day work week. Uh, if, if you've ever seen a, 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 Jap, a Chinese work crew uh, anywhere in the world, they, they don't work five days. They work seven. I'm not saying I want to institute a seven-day work week in America, but we can, we can shift our people through. We can also uh, staff during peak times. I think we can, we can even think about having part-time workers, which is also not allowed under the, uh, under the current uh, customs and border uh, uh, agreements that we have. The fascinating thing is that other aspects of flight, which also include safety to our country, are. And we, we part-time them. So I, I, I don't think, uh, I, don't think I, I think we have to push the issue much more. Uh, clearly, you, you know, the, the structural efficiency of having the Congress do it uh, uh, is not a good idea, but, uh, but, I, but I think uh, it, is a, it is essential. And, and, and by the way, and I think most folks understand that, uh, that this is an, an element of, of competitiveness today. We have time for one more question, if anyone wants to raise anything. And if not, um, please join me in, oh, do we have a question? Hi, I'm Gary Becker. Um, you made a great point earlier about the fact that 76 booths uh, exist, and yet many of them are not being staffed. Uh, this is a statement, maybe it's part of a question, but I would urge that as CBP and DHS continues to request more CBP officers, maybe there should be a link between the officers that they request and staffing the booths. So it's not just an issue of we need more officers, but we need more officers to staff the booths. Part of what part of what happens is that, you know, when when you're getting to 18 billion, uh, you can almost uh, I don't know, I mean I'm sure you're aware of this, right? But some of the safest communities in America right now are the border communities along Texas. I mean, mm -hmm. when you have that many federal workers rocking around, crime tends to go down. Uh, and uh, the reality is that we, we have the same problems at airports and uh, that, that you would have on the border. And we need better trained folks uh, to do it. We need to have the flexibility of man hours, as you mentioned, to, to address it. Uh, uh, and, and we're not getting that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, if we take a step back and we think about this as part of our competitive advantage, uh, most of you are in this room well, not most of you. A, a good portion of this room might have traveled in Latin America 20 years ago. If you remember arriving almost in any airport, right, there was a sign that said, uh, U.S. citizens, nationals, everybody else, right? And it was good. It was you. You know, you pulled out your American passport. You know, 
if if I was from any of those countries, once being tr uh, getting the treatment at, at an American airport, I would take down the U.S. Uh, one, and that's what's happened, right? Uh, El Salvador is a country I traveled a great deal to when I was much much younger. Uh, it, it had a, a, a line for U.S. In fact, the, and the. That line's no longer there. Now they make a stand with everybody else. And part of that everybody else is the feeling that we are not having the discretion and the wisdom uh, to treat our, our, our partners and folks we deal with in, a, in an adequate way to make them feel welcome uh, and make sure that we know who they are, but in the end make them feel welcome and make them feel uh, willing to invest uh, in, our, in, our, uh, in our country. Congressman, thank you so much um, for being here. Do you have any uh, final words for us? Look, uh, I, I, I would tell you that it's important to engage on this immigration debate. Uh, you know, there, there's, some, there's some belief here in, in Washington that the, the U.S. government can only engage on one thing at a time. The immigration debate has to be taken care of, just like so many other debates that are going on. But it, it, it will be something that will come back to haunt us if we don't do this right. Uh, we have... Uh, a country who's, who's, I think, on the verge of, of having uh, tremendous growth. We've, we've got uh, an opportunity here to do right, um, but it requires everybody in good faith to, to try to figure out a point. And you're going to hear us do all sorts of, again, border security debate that you're going to hear from, from us that's going to push this debate to the right. Uh, I think we do it just so that, so that the Republicans have something to gnaw on as we go forward. But, but the reality is our, broke, our immigration system is broken at every level. And for the last four years, uh, as this ship is sinking, we've been passing out nicer and better bales uh, uh, to keep the water out the boat, as opposed to bring it into harbor, fix it, and uh, make our country be as efficient and as productive as it can be. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, thank you. Sir, thank you. Um, I, I will take a, a one to two minute break as the first panel on the impact of, U of customs delays on uh, U.S. competitiveness. And Congressman, again, thank you so much.
everyone can please take their seats, please. So I have the distinct honor and privilege of introducing um, the next um, panel, not just in substance, but also um, I'd like to introduce as the moderator, uh, Mr. Rick Ozzie Nelson. For those of you who have been around CSIS a little bit, he was uh, my predecessor in the Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Program, and he left me a fantastic legacy of events, one of which was this. So uh, thank you, Ozzie. Um, but by way of introduction, Ozzie was one of my uh, favorite colleagues here at CSIS. Not only does he bring um, to any job he undertakes um, the Navy aviator a sense of humor, which if you don't know what that is, um, I encourage you to find out. It's a, a lot of fun. Um, but he was here for... Um, some four years as the director of the Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Program. We recently lost him to, to the private sector. He is now the vice president for business development at Crossmatch Technologies, which is a biometrics firm here in DC. But um, I'm very pleased to introduce him um, as the moderator of this panel on the impact of customs delays on US competitiveness. So please, Ozzy. Well, uh, thank you, Stephanie, for that kind introduction. It's great to be uh, uh, back here at CSIS and, of course, with this panel with uh, people that we've worked with in the past, and we continue to be very grateful at CSIS for the support of U.S. travel and uh, and to have these partnerships to bring these issues that are important. I mean, that's where we get the issues from, is from those that are most affected by it, and we've had a great relationship with uh, with Jeff and uh, uh, Patricia at U.S. travel, so we're, we're thankful for that. Um, this is a terrific panel. I look forward to this discussion. It's going to be driven in large part by your questions. Uh, but before we do that, I, I have to give a brief introduction to each of our panelists um, here who are here today to share our thoughts. You know, first, immediately to my left is Jeff Friedman. He's the COO and the Executive Vice President of U.S. Travel Association. Again, someone we worked with at CSIS many times in the past. Um, he's been a very instrumental in uh, being a, a strong, strong, leading a strong voice for the travel industry. Um, in fact, um, he was uh, critical to getting the Travel Promotion Act uh, passed through Congress, or at least uh, helping Congress get it passed. And, and many people have called that the industry's uh, biggest legislative victory in over a decade. Um, so it's quite an accomplishment for, for U.S. travel and, and for Jeff. Uh, prior to that, he was vice president of APCO Worldwide and director of government relations and strategic outreach at Freddie Mac, and then also served as director of strategic initiatives for the American Association of Health Plans. So again, a thought leader on these issues, and it will be great to hear Jeff's voice today. So thanks, Jeff, for being here. Second, um, it's always good to see CSIS. Sometimes we uh, get stuck in the national security. You know, I'm going to have someone from the Department of Defense here, so I like these issues because we get U.S. travel folks here, and then we also get people from the U.S. Department of Commerce um, who can provide us a perspective that sometimes we don't think about. And it's always great to have individuals uh, like a second speaker, Isabel Hill, here. She's Director of Office of Travel and Tourism Industries at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, she um, she is responsible for, she chairs the Tourism Committee for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. Um, as Director for Policy and Planning, she uh, puts promotes policies to foster competitive to U.S. travel, which is one of the things that we're going to focus on today. Um, she also does a lot of work in our bilateral relationships with our, our partners overseas to ensure we have the, the, the best models in place. Um, prior to this, um, she um, she's uh, for Federal Federal Service. She was a Director of Business and uh, Policy and Business Development for South Carolina Departments of Park, Recreation, and Tourism, and also served as the Film Commissioner of the State of the South. That's the one I want to hear about. What does the Film Commissioner of the State of the South Carolina do? Uh, and then lastly, um, we're, again, if we're, we're thrilled to have an industry. Again, we usually at CSIS, we have Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and those types of individuals here. It's good to have a voice from uh, a non-traditional CSIS partner like American Airlines. So we're, uh, we're thrilled to have uh, Michael Wascom. He's Managing Director in International uh, and Government Affairs at American Airlines. He's been there since 2007, and before joining American Airlines, uh, Michael served as counselor to the Undersecretary of the Department of Transportation and was also Deputy Assistant Secretary for Government Affairs at the Department. So uh, a truly terrific panel to give us a variety of uh, viewpoints on this critical issue. What we're going to do is uh, have five to seven remarks from each of the panelists, and then we'll go ahead into questions and answers from each of you at the audience. So Jeff, we'll turn it over to you for the opening remarks. And we'll turn the mic on. Uh, for the ladies in the room, I'm sorry to report that Isabel tells me the notebook was really not filmed in South Carolina, so she can't talk about that today. Um, but I know we all would have, would have liked to have heard about that. 
Uh, thank you for coming out. We appreciate this. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, what is a, uh, an increasingly problematic issue, the entry process, the customs process at our major gateway airports. Uh, as most of you know, international travel is critical to the United States. It's helping to drive our economic recovery. Right now, the travel industry is adding jobs at a faster clip than any other sector of the economy. Uh, every 33 international visitors that we receive helps us create one more American job. These visitors stay longer, they spend more, they go into these communities and buy our products, uh, but they go home without using our healthcare system, without using our educational system. They leave their money, they go home with a better impression of the United States, and you simply can't beat that. International travel to the United States is critical. And when we talk international, overseas is really critical. And just to give you a perspective on that, the average American that travels around the country spends about three or $400 per person per trip. The average Canadian and Mexican spends about $1,200 per person per trip as they travel around the country. The average overseas visitor, uh, which is using that airport uh, customs process on 100% of their visitation into the United States, spends nearly $4,500 per person per visit. China, Brazil, nearly $7,000 per person per visit. So you get a sense of just how important these visitors are. But as the Washington Post outlined on Saturday, fewer and fewer of these visitors are coming to the United States. Despite the economic recovery we're seeing, despite the fact that we are, uh, we've turned the tide on the lost decade of international travelers following 9-11, the U.S.'s market share of these visitors, these long-haul travelers, has fallen from 17% pre-9-11 to 12% today. This in a time when overseas travel is booming. More and more people around the world are traveling, but on a, on a um, uh, market share basis, fewer and fewer of them are coming to the United States. A significant issue that we obviously need to address because of the economic importance of these visitors, because of the diplomatic importance of welcoming these visitors. When you talk to them, however, you quickly get an understanding of why they may not be coming. And we've been speaking with these international travelers for several years. Going back to our earliest research, they identified three things that were critical to visiting the United States. One part is an efficient visa process. And huge credit needs to go to the State Department for the successes that have taken place in reducing visa wait times for visitors, particularly in Brazil, China, India, and elsewhere around the world. A little over a year ago, if you wanted a visa to come to the United States, your wait time in Brazil or China was well over 100 days. Today, those wait times are down to less than 15 days, often less than a week uh, in many instances. And as I said, great credit to the Obama administration, to the State Department in particular, for the successes there. A second thing that's critical to these visitors is marketing, is promotion, is an acknowledgement of what the country has to offer, and most important, is a welcoming message. Unfortunately, after 9-11, a perception took hold that visitors were no longer as welcome as they were before 9-11. They want to know that we're open for business. They want to know that we want their business. And the third element of welcoming these visitors is a friendly, efficient entry process, a customs process where these visitors know that America wants their business. Now, back in 2006, we did a survey of more than 2,000 international travelers. And at that time, we asked them, what are some of your greatest concerns when considering a trip to the United States? About 48% said, I'm sorry, about 48% uh, uh, said, my greatest concern when considering a trip to the United States is the threat of crime or terrorism. 72% ranked uh, as a major concern of theirs U.S. immigration officials. Now, whether it's right or wrong, when you look at that, what these travelers are saying is U.S. immigration officials are more deterrent to me than al-Qaeda, than terrorism, when considering a trip to the United States. Now, that's one survey. However, we went back into the field just last week or two weeks ago, and we'll release this data next week. And the problem is that some of these same concerns remain. Nearly 40% of visitors to the United States say that the customs process is a deterrent to coming and they're telling their friends and family not to come to the United States. These travelers, on average, speak, uh, tell others, uh, tell about eight people, uh, on average, about their experience coming here. And what they're telling us is they're telling them not to come. Business travelers, two out of five business travelers say, I'm avoiding trips to the United States because of the inefficiencies in the customs process. About 15% of these travelers claim to be missing connecting flights because of the difficulty of getting in here. A third call the process of entering into the United States embarrassing for a country of our, of our standards. 
These are issues that simply must be addressed. And they're issues that can be addressed. More than 80% of these international visitors believe that the U.S. could fix these customs issues if we really wanted to do so. So how do we do that? Three things, I think, come to mind first and foremost for us. And there are many solutions here, but there are three things that could be done in short order. One, we need to set a standard for these wait times. Enough of the two and three hour long wait times to get through LAX, O'Hare, JFK, which is happening all too frequently. We need to set a standard for these visitors to get into the country of 30 minutes or less to clear them through the customs process. Two, we need to add greater transparency as to what's happening. You know, one reason the visa issue is a, uh, perhaps an easier issue to address is because the State Department has had the courage to post online on a daily basis the wait departments at every single wait times at every single consulate around the world. We need the same transparency into customs data to look at what's happening at wait times, not just average wait times, but at all hours of the day, at those peak times when travelers are coming in. We need access to that data. We need to be able to see these customs halls and, and determine and show others what the problem is and what it would take to address it. And three, we need to add greater flexibility. We need to add greater flexibility with part-time, with retired, as Congressman Garcia was talking about, with other types of officials in this difficult budgetary environment that we're in. We need to think a little bit more creatively on the staffing side to address some of the challenges that we have. Now, all the data that I talked about, all the negativity that I talked about that these travelers feel was all taken before the sequester even hit. And as Secretary Napolitano has said, the customs process will be a prime example of what happens when we cut back in an indiscriminate way on our spending. Already we're hearing examples of these wait times climbing. Before the sequester, they were already at an unacceptable level. You can only imagine where they'll go to now. This is an area of too much importance to let these, uh, these issues slide. International travel is critical to our economic recovery. It has already played a, uh, an important role in our economic recovery. And anything less than our best efforts to address these issues will prevent us from maximizing travel's potential and creating the jobs that we so desire to create. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, thanks for that. Um, very succinct. And uh, you, we're on time. I appreciate that. Obviously, a very strong voice for the industry and a good scene setter for our next set of remarks. So, Isabel, you can feel free to do them from up there or at the, the table, wherever you're most comfortable. This is fine. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Good morning. How are you? Good. Well, I, the cherry blossoms are blooming, um, the first harbingers of spring, so we'll be seeing um, more and more visitors here in Washington soon. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you at the Center for Strategic and International Studies to talk about the competitiveness of the travel and tourism industry for the United States. And the good news is that with respect to travel and tourism, the United States is arguably the most competitive destination in the world. We are number one in revenues generated from travel and tourism, and we are number two in arrivals for um, visitors to the United States. So we are in a very strong competitive position according to the United Nations World Tourism Organization. In 2011, 62 million visitors, international visitors, came to the United States and spent a record $153 billion on U.S. travel and tourism related goods, which supported 1.2 million U.S. jobs and accounted for 25% of all U.S. service travel, of all U.S. service exports. So travel and tourism is a quarter of all U.S. service exports. So this is a very important topic as Jeff uh, was indicating. We have set records for international arrivals in four out of the last five years, and we expect this trend to continue uh, when the final figures are in for 2012. But as Jeff pointed out, despite our competitive position in real terms, in uh, relative terms, the United States arguably has not kept up entirely with the growth of travel and tourism global demand. There are a number of reasons for this. Um, uh, part of it is that the growth for travel and tourism is being generated out of Asia, and increasingly uh, there are regional travel patterns uh, that put the U.S. in even more difficult competitive position. In addition, we've been competing with countries, as probably most of you are aware, who have uh, for many years had tourism promotion campaigns that they run internationally, uh, and the United States has not. 
but because the United States is in a competitive, a good competitive position, and because there is a market opportunity out there, travel and tourism is a pillar of the President's national export strategy. And we are putting the pieces in place to ensure that we maintain our competitiveness and that we grow and increase travel and tourism exports so that we can create jobs here in the United States. The Travel Promotion Act established a private corporation known as Brand USA, which is charged with promoting the United States as a travel destination and with communicating U.S. policy to travelers coming to this country. In addition, in January 2011, President Obama issued an executive order on travel and tourism that called for the development of a national travel and tourism strategy and the establishment of visa and foreign processing visitor goals. The strategy was developed by the Task Force on Travel Competitiveness, which was jointly chaired by the Secretary of Commerce and the Secretary of the Interior. And it included a dozen agencies, ranging from the Department of Homeland Security and the State Department, the Department of Agriculture, Transportation, Small Business Administration, Agriculture, I think I said, um, and Labor, among others, all came together to develop a comprehensive strategy. And this strategy sets a, a, a government-wide goal of welcoming 100 million visitors by 2021, who we expect will spend $250 billion annually. And we are also encouraging Americans to see all that America has to offer. In brief, the strategy lays out several areas that the federal agencies will collaborate on. We will work by, pr to promote the United States by working with Brand USA and separately to communicate that the United States wants and welcomes international visitors. We'll work to enable and enhance travel to and within the United States, including enhancing trusted traveler programs, expedited screening initiatives, as well as improving the process of arrival and aviation security screening. We will work to provide world-class customer service and visitor experiences so that we can inspire repeat visitation and positive word of mouth. We'll work to coordinate across government and with the private sector to ensure that we are all working to work together towards our common goals, to grow our economy and to create jobs. And we will conduct research to measure results. The National Travel and Tourism Strategy is now being implemented by the Travel and Tourism Policy Council, which is comprised of the agencies that developed the strategy and is chaired by the Secretary of Commerce. And the results have been positive. The number of international visitors and exports from travel and tourism is on track to set another record in 2012 when the final figures come in. And we expect that those figures will have been, will recognize approximately a 10% increase in exports over 2011. This is well over the 5% average that we will need to reach our goals for the national travel and tourism strategy. But with Brand USA now actively marketing and with federal agencies working together to implement the strategy, this growth is expected to continue. Our national strategy depends on creating a quality experience, including creating a welcoming experience for legitimate travelers. And it, <coughs> excuse me, it depends on effectively guarding against the possible negative impacts of a potential security threat or a world health problem. And yet important agencies, including Customs and Border Protection, are also challenged to meet increased demand for services with existing resources and legislative constraints. And so what is the answer? I think Jeff has offered some in interesting and, and I think very positive uh, uh, solutions. Um, I would propose that there are some other considerations as well. From my perspective, one of the most important developments in this area has been the adoption of a risk-based security screening process. This approach allows a process that identifies low-risk travelers and expedites their entry into the country so that resources then can be appropriately focused on travelers who are either unknown or who may pose a threat to our country. On this premise, Customs and Border Protection is re-engineering processes and redeploying resources in innovative ways to ensure that we can facilitate a growing number of visitors in such a way that enhances, not compromises, security. Trusted travel programs like Global Entry, Nexus, and others allow travelers to voluntarily provide information and biometrics and go through kiosks rather than taking up officers' time. It makes 
a good use of limited resources, and it improves the customer experience. I think solutions are also found in the area of public-private partnerships. The private sector has helped and can continue to help to make progress in this area. Airlines, hotels, and credit card companies have partnered with the Department of Homeland Security to promote the enrollment of frequent flyers to en and to ensure that technologies are compatible with the screening process. As part of the Model Ports program, companies like Universal, Disney, and Marriott have assisted with Lyme management and customer service solutions. And while this panel is largely focused on air travel, it's important to note that our largest markets are in Mexico and Canada, and 60% of those travel by land. And so it, I think it is important for the industry to continue to work with Customs and Border Protection to identify and support necessary investments in infrastructure and technology. And CBP can continue to work with the private sector to harmonize requirements across the points of border um, entry, especially with respect to land-based tour operators. To measure progress, we've developed a travel and tourism dashboard that includes metrics on the performance of travel and tourism in general, international processing times at major ports of entry, although I will acknowledge that the definitions there are still in progress, applications and enrollments in trusted traveler programs, and other metrics of travel facilitation processes so that we can see whether we are on track and what the correlations are between these figures. It is important to our security, it is important to our economy, and to the perception of the United States as a travel destination that we get this right. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. So we're getting substantive information and we're getting a lot of numbers. I'm sure some of the policy people in the crowd are thrown by all these digits. But this is great. So uh, um, it, it helps make an argument. So Michael, the bar has been set high. Um, so you're batting third. Time to knock in some runs. I'll do my best. Uh, and I have some more numbers for you. Um, it, first of all, I want to thank uh, CSIS uh, and U.S. Travel for uh, hosting this morning's event. Uh, it's a very timely subject uh, for all of us um, because we do value very much the partnership that we have at American Airlines with our friends in the travel and tourism industry as well as our friends in government, across the government, uh, at the Commerce Department and what they do in promoting travel and tourism to the United States, but also uh, the agencies that, um, that protect us. And we don't have to look uh, too far back to the events of 9-11 um, to understand why. So it's important that um, you know, we work constructively uh, with those agencies of government to put the best programs in place. And while we're having some challenges right now, you know, I'm confident that we're going to find the solutions uh, and the resources necessary to move forward. Um, I like to sort of set the stage on this topic by uh, looking at some of the progress that was made over the years, administration to administration, to open uh, the aviation markets around the world through open skies agreements, uh, whether it's the Obama administration, the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, it goes way back uh, to tremendous successes over the years in liberalizing air travel around the world to ensure that it's truly a global uh, industry as it is today. The Transportation Department, the State Department, the Commerce Department have worked very hard to obtain those often difficult uh, agreements, the most recent ones being the European Union uh, and Japan. Uh, we also have liberalized travel now uh, to and from Brazil. At the same time, we've had the successes of liberalizing air travel around the world. We've had a homeland security regime that was put in place after 9-11 that oftentimes appears to suffocate the very success that we've had um, on opening markets. You have to balance the two. Uh, the Homeland Security regime is a very necessary process. The individuals that undertook those horrible acts on 9-11 had no business being in this country in the first place. And so, you know, our CBP uh, officers, our TSA, you know, they're the front lines of protecting the homeland, and that has to continue. Um, but we need to find that midpoint between making the United States a welcoming place to visit, uh, whether it's for leisure, uh, travelers, business travels, uh, business travelers, uh, students, um, the academic community, and simultaneously protecting um, our homeland. Um, at American Airlines, we are primarily in five major hubs uh, right now. Uh, hopefully, 
depending on the outcome of our merger activity with U.S. Airways, that will grow to eight. Uh, but we're in Miami, New York, JFK, Chicago, O'Hare, Dallas, Fort Worth, um, and Los Angeles, uh, five of the biggest population centers in the country, uh, and certainly five of the busiest uh, ports of entry um, in the nation. Um, and I want to echo some of what, uh, what the concerns that Jeff raised in his opening remarks, and the congressman who preceded this panel uh, talked a little bit about the situation in Miami. Uh, for us at American Airlines, we recently uh, opened a new uh, concourse, Terminal D, um, state-of-the-art facility uh, with a new state-of-the-art federal inspection uh, facility uh, that has 72 uh, inspection stations uh, and is equipped to handle on average about 3,600 passengers uh, an hour through that facility. Um, if you go to New York JFK, our Terminal 8 state-of-the-art facility, um, the most modern uh, facility uh, in the industry. So we are doing our part, we think, to put the facilities in place um, whether it's the terminal or the, uh, the processing facility at our various uh, stations. But I got some statistics earlier this morning just to give you a sense um, of the situation at Miami. Uh, and these came in the form of an email when I was sitting in the front row before I came up here. At, uh, as of 7 o'clock this morning, um, these were the stats. Um, 4.30 this morning, again, keeping in mind we had 72 inspection stations um, at Miami, there were 14 inspectors on duty. At 5.30, there were 11. At 7 a.m., there were 13. Uh, and the comment was made that the facility was already wall-to-wall. -wall. Um, and that anticipated uh, passengers w would be missing um, their connections. As of 9 a.m., uh, just before the congressman started to speak, we had already misconnected 156 passengers. Um, and there were eight uh, inspectors uh, on duty, and the queue was about 80% full. The good news was we were told by 9.30, which should have already happened by now, uh, that we would have a total of 33 inspectors, so up from 8 to 33, in a facility that can accommodate 72. Um, CBP is limited in its resources, and we understand that. Uh, they're, they're only given what the Congress appropriates and so forth. So our challenge is to work with them to find those solutions to sort of bridge that gap um, and to work with Congress. I want to be clear, I think all, all too often, you know, the burden appears to be put on the agency as if it's completely within their realm to solve all the problems. And that's not the case. It's imperative that those of us in industry work side by side with them, but we also have to work with our elected officials um, to make sure that the resources are sent through the regular process in Capitol Hill and the Congress uh, to get them what they need. Um, some of the programs that we would like to see revisited um, are the visa waiver program. Uh, can that be expanded? I think we've had great success with those countries that are currently um, participating in it. Um, transit without visa. In Miami in particular, if you're a Brazilian citizen, we would very much like to have you fly on one of our American Airlines flights from Brazil to Miami. And if you decide to stay in Miami, that's great. If you want to connect in Miami, that's fine too. We can fly you to a whole host of other cities. But you have to have a visa. Uh, it's expensive. Um, and just to transit the Miami airport, even if you're not leaving the airport, and if you can be kept in a sterile facility, you still have to have a visa. Uh, that was a program that existed before 9-11. Um, it was dismantled after 9-11. Um, we would like to see that tool at least uh, put back in place or let's do a pilot program or something um, to see if, if we, can, uh, we can bring that back to ease the burden on what we're seeing in these customs facilities. Um, there was a letter uh, that if you haven't seen, I'd be happy to share with you back on January the 10th that was co-signed by a whole host of travel and tourism uh, entities from U.S. Travel to Airlines for America. Uh, to Marriott Corporation, um, essentially making the case that um, global travel and tourism is critical to the nation's economy and we need to come together to solve these problems. And it's conferences like this and discussions like this that will help uh, move the ball forward. But again, I go back to the challenge of we have to balance um, the needs of Homeland Security and simultaneously balance the needs of making this country a welcoming place because, as Jeff pointed out, um, those statistics are spot on. Um, we are not the most welcoming country in the world anymore, and that must change. 
those of us in the airline industry, and I could say this, I'm speaking just on behalf of American, um, and I touched on those five cities that are, are major hubs for us. I think if someone were sitting here from Delta or United, they would echo the same comments. Uh, they're seeing the same challenges in their airports uh, in Atlanta, in Chicago, in Houston, uh, and so forth. So a uh, huge task ahead, um, but I think we're slowly making progress. We're looking to expand our fleet to meet the demands of the traveling public. Um, we're not going to put a flight into a place where there's no demand, and those demands are continuing to go up. And so we want to be there to, to serve that need, but the progress that's been made on promoting travel and tourism, which is exceptional. State Department, our embassies and consulates around the world deserve huge credit for reducing those wait times, particularly in places like China and Brazil which are two of the most lucrative markets in the travel, global travel and tourism uh, uh, industry, those times have come way down. But if those uh, foreign visitors have had success in getting an expedited visa to come here only to wait in a three-hour queue and misconnect on their flight, all that progress is for naught. So uh, I think we need to see it through to its final, uh, final stage, which is a more expedited process. And the Global Entry Program, uh, is an excellent program um, that is uh, growing by leaps and bounds, and it dovetails into the uh, TSA pre-check program. We're strongly encouraging passengers uh, to avail themselves of those programs, sign up for it. Um, it makes for a much more efficient uh, experience uh, at an airport, um, especially if you can come in, use global entry, and then immediately go out and um, uh, go back through uh, TSA pre-check. One of the problems and this goes back to Miami, and I, this was my personal experience uh, the weekend of the inauguration. I had my global entry zipped right through. Got my little piece of paper out of the kiosk, uh, retrieved my baggage. Then I was in a long line to leave the facility. There was a queue strictly for flight crew members, diplomats, and global entry card holders that snaked all the way around the baggage carousel. So again, the efficiency on the front end of me putting my fingerprints on the machine, getting my card and leaving the facility, I hit a huge line trying to leave that slowed me down, slowed the crew members down that were trying to connect to other flights. Again, sort of defeated the purpose of why I had the, uh, the benefit uh, on the front end. So those are things that I think we can work through. But with that, I'll close and be happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much for that, Michael. And, and you added a flavor of bipartisanship and collaboration. So thank you. So this panel has it all. Metrics, substance, collaboration, bipartisanship. Um, so it's great. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and start with the first question. Uh, again, this has been a, this is a great mix of ideas and thoughts here. Um, we're talking specifically, though, about the more strategic concept of U.S. competitiveness. And we've used a lot of, of metrics to to highlight, you know, the trends. You know, Jeff, on one hand, you said we've seen, a, and if I got this wrong, please correct me, a decrease from, I think, 17 or 19 percent to 12 percent pre-9-11. But at the same time, Isabel says we're, we have record numbers of people coming into the United States. So for, for what does it really mean to U.S. competitiveness? And can you cite some examples, um, not just to the travel industry, but, you know, how this actually, the impact on travel and tourism is actually hurting U.S. competitiveness globally? Globally. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, um, there's truth in both Isabel's numbers and in our numbers. We're saying the same thing. Uh, the volume of travelers. We have more international travelers today than we've ever had. So that's a positive. At the same time, the global uh, number of travelers has risen dramatically. So we can either rest on our laurels and say we're fine. I don't see Coca-Cola doing that. I don't see McDonald's doing that. I don't see any private sector business saying we're number one. So we'll, we'll stop here. Um, or we can say, how do we regain the market share we've had? How do we continue to grow? When you look at our economy and the shifts that are taking place, we're moving from more of a manufacturing-based economy to more of a services-related uh, economy. Travel is the epitome of a service-related economy. It's the number one export we have as a country. So as we make that shift, we have no choice but to ask ourselves, how do we help this grow? How do we tap into this demand that's out there? And the fact is, today, we're not tapping into that demand 
as well as we could. And I think Michael's points are, are spot on. Much of the, uh, the responsibility here lies with Congress to provide the resources necessary to tap into that. When you ask how is it affecting our competitiveness, I think, I think it happens in a couple ways. One, that traveler who comes here and has a poor experience getting through, as, as they document themselves, they go home and tell at least eight people about that. So there are eight people that may or may not, if they listen to their friends, word of mouth being how most of us make our travel decisions, those people may decide not to come here. You look at business travelers, uh, two out of five saying, I'm avoiding coming to the United States. These business travelers are people that are coming here to buy Caterpillar tractors, to go to the Consumer Electronics Show and look at the various American products that are being sold, and to go to other meetings and conventions around this country. If they choose to go to South Korea, if they choose to go to Western Europe, Europe, if they choose to go to other countries to make these big purchases, America pays a heavy price. The best example of this, and I'll just close with this, was a full-page story in the Times of London a couple years ago. And it was Travel to America, No Thanks. And it listed 10 places around the world that you could go for an American-like experience without having to go through the trouble of getting into the United States. So instead, instead of going to Michigan Avenue in Chicago to do your shopping there, here's a similar place in Paris you can go to. Instead of driving the Pacific Coast Highway, go try this highway in Australia. You know, they're already out there you know, really marketing, and this is the mainstream press, marketing alternative destinations because of the difficulties. And that speaks to the competitiveness issue. Isabel? Um, absolutely. I don't think that these, these figures are incompatible. Um, you know, we are number one in, um, in absolute terms. But uh, as Jeff pointed out, that there, there is also the, you know, competitiveness is dynamic. It is not a static thing. Um, uh, and so I think, uh, from my perspective, I agree with, with uh, largely what, what Jeff was saying. Um, you know, the question is, how do we look at the question of market share? Um, I think that some additional work can be done to, to give us better data on that, quite frankly. Um, the figures that we use come generally from the World Travel Organization. And if you look deeply into those figures in terms of global growth, a lot of that growth is being driven out of China. Um, but China's figures would include, for example, people who are going to uh, Macau. Uh, so the question is, when you're looking at competitiveness, as you would if you were Coca-Cola, the question is, who is our competition and, and where are our markets more specifically? So I, I think when we're looking at, at, at the macro, uh, this, this is absolutely true. But I do think that some additional work could be done uh, in looking at the question of market share by defining the market um, for the United States and our competitiveness in, the, in those markets. We, in one market, we may be competing with some countries. In another market, we may be competing with another. Sure. Thank you for that. Michael, do you want to? Yeah, just another comment, and I think Jeff sort of touched on this a little bit, uh, and it's sort of this domino effect that happens um, when travelers are discouraged or they view it as too much of a hassle uh, to come to the United States because of the various uh, delays and so forth that they're likely to see. You know, it becomes the domino effect. We want these customers on our airplanes. When I say our, you know, we'd love it if they always flew American Airlines, but we want them on airlines of the United States. And when they arrive, we want them staying in our hotels, visiting our amusement parks, renting cars from our car rental companies. And if the first piece of that equation doesn't play out appropriately, then none of the rest of it happens. And so it's major lost revenue um, and economic, economic activity uh, that comes with it. So uh, I think just from a competitive perspective, um, other countries um, are benefiting to some degree for, uh, you know, what could be considered lost, uh, lost business. You know, our numbers are still not to where they were pre-9-11. We're getting there, but they're not to where they were pre-9-11. Uh, there was a dramatic drop-off in uh, international travel to the U.S. after 9-11 for obvious reasons, and we've been trying to build that number back up. Um, it's incumbent upon us as individual companies to, you know, come up with new opportunities. You know, we're starting a flight uh, in May from Dallas-Fort Worth to Seoul, Korea. You know, that's an untapped market for us. But if those Korean travelers then meet with uh, long delays or, or problems upon arrival at Dallas-Fort Worth, they're going to probably rethink whether they take that trip again, which then threatens the viability of that flight that we've just invested in. So, 
Let me, let me ask one more follow-on question, and we'll go to the audience. I'll get your questions ready, please. Um, well, along the lines of competitiveness, and you know, I'd like the Coca-Cola example was great, you know, the competitors have to be doing something to improve their product as well. So is there some, what, are the, what are our international competitors doing, uh, perhaps better than we are in, 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 in airports or even in ports, in ports of entry, and are there any models that we can adopt or to our products we can adopt from our international competitors? And let's go reverse order. Michael, do you want to go first this time? Sure. I think I can speak uh, primarily just on the airline side, not so much the airport side. Uh, but at American, uh, We've invested, even while we're restructuring uh, in the bankruptcy proceeding, invested in 460 new aircraft, 200 from Boeing and 260 from Airbus. Those are gradually coming online. So we are reinventing uh, our own product to be more competitive globally. If you look at what some of the foreign airlines are doing, particularly those who are based in the Middle East and the products that they uh, offer, uh, it's exceptional. And we have to raise our uh, level of product offering to compete uh, with them. Ironically, some of the challenges that we face here in the United States pale in comparison to what we're uh, experiencing right now in Europe uh, from the regulatory uh, side of the equation. Uh, Europe is becoming a far more difficult place to do business uh, if you're an airline because of some of the policies of the European Commission. Uh, that is to the benefit of other countries. Uh, at some point, there are many people, many experts, who would say that uh, right now, for international travel, London, Paris, Frankfurt, and Amsterdam are the primary connection points in Europe. We feed the London hub with our partnership with British Airways. Delta feeds uh, Paris and Amsterdam with its partnership with Air France and KLM. And United Airlines feeds uh, Frankfurt with its partnership with Lufthansa. Um, it's becoming increasingly difficult to do business in Europe. The beneficiary? are the airports and the airlines of the Middle East. Again, that's lost revenue, lost business uh, for the United States and for the Europeans. Um, so you, you sort of layer this into that larger equation, and you've just compounded what was already a difficult problem. Isabel? Well, I think, uh, you know, touching again on, on, on the question of, of marketing, um, uh, for many years the United States did not promote itself as, uh, as a destination. We ran a um, tourism promotion campaign, a pilot project, um, out of the Department of Commerce that uh, demonstrated that you could get a tremendous return on investment, as other countries have been doing, in pulling together the, uh, the destinations. Uh, we had been relying on individual destinations to market themselves, and they've done a very effective job for their destinations as a whole. But from a policy perspective, I think one of the um, opportunities for the United States is to look at how we can um, spread the benefit of travel and tourism throughout the country. And I think a global marketing campaign, national campaign, is going to be very helpful in that. And I think that some of the opportunities, if you will, for, for product offerings come from the federal perspective in um, moving some of the population out of our over-visited uh, destinations, national parks, and, and whatnot. We have some wonderful areas that are much less better, well known, and we have some overcrowding in some of the areas that uh, are better known. So I think that, that as we begin to communicate all that America has to offer, that, that we will be more competitive. And I think that there really are some very good best practices that we can look at in other countries as to how they have done that. Thank you. Well, Jeff? Yeah, I would just add to that, I think what, what other countries have done, and there are concrete examples of this, is they have uh, done more than the United States to embrace travel as a critical economic driver. And when they make that, uh, that decision, they look at the issue in totality. How do we increase travel it means we have to look at marketing, as Isabel was mentioning. We need to look at our visa process. We need to look at our customs process. And the fourth thing I would add to that, we have to look at our infrastructure. And when you look at those four pieces, there are countless examples. Much of Western Europe has removed the visa requirement for Brazilians. You can imagine the competitive disadvantage that puts us at if Brazilians have to travel to one of four consulates in a country of that size to come here. 
and they don't have to get a visa to go to Western Europe. You can see that challenge, and competitively, that doesn't put us in a great position. Look at the airports that are being built across China versus the investment we're making in airports here in the United States. Uh, it's not even uh, on the same playing field. Uh, you see other countries that are looking at travel in totality, why this is an economic driver, and making business decisions to address that. We tend to look at things more of a one-off to the extent we can get Congress to focus on these issues at all. I give the Obama administration incredible credit here for looking at travel issues more seriously than probably any administration uh, in the past has done. They've made headway in welcoming these international visitors, uh, but we have a long way to go to keep up with our competitors around the world. Terrific. Terrific. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll go ahead into the questions to the audience now. The first one right up front, wait for the microphone. Again, please uh, state your name, affiliation if you have one, and a question. Sure. My name is Olivia Trevisani. I work with CSC. Um, CSC is a supporter of Global Entry for the Office of Field Ops, and so I appreciate your, your kudos as the growth international for GE is um, huge. And so I've heard a lot of kudos also towards the visa processing overseas through the State Department. I wonder if there's a way to consolidate the efforts then, maybe have global enrollment centers um, at the embassies and the consulates overseas so that you can kind of uh, do more of a consolidation between frequent travelers and trusted travelers. Um, but so that's just a point of thought. But my question is actually, so if you combine cross-match with what you do, Jeff, I'm wondering if there's a way to, um, and I love the kiosk business, but get out of the kiosk business and go to mobility um, using biometrics through your phone so that nobody has to necessarily even wait on any kind of a you know, line and we don't need to use as many people resources. Instead, somebody can you know, check in or go through customs, get some kind of a... Um, uh, barcode that then you scan and you know then be able to go through. I w was wondering if there's any thoughts or pilots or um, that have gone into that already and then um, if there is time. Michael I'm curious, airlines are incentivized obviously to also be competitive against other airlines so has there been any talk about the airlines taking on more authority and more responsibility in the customs processing? Um, if we don't have, again, as many resources for that CBP is funded for, then maybe the airlines can take over some of that. Wow, great question. You can have my job if you want it. That's really good. Let's a um, lot, lot of lot of meat on the on the table here. We'll go just work the way down the, on the row again, if that's okay, Jeff. Sure, I'll just touch on two of those points, and, and I'm happy Ozzy set you up with the cross-match promotion. That was uh, well done. Um, first of all, on global entry, global entry is a fabulous program. And uh, credit to, uh, to CBP for getting that program up and running uh, and for realizing the potential inherent in it. Uh, if we are to realize that potential, however, uh, we have to look at uh, the marketing and enrollment, I think, in a different way. Uh, right now, it is 100% operated by the federal government. And uh, despite our best efforts, if you go to the website, uh, that's, that's not a website that would be akin to what you would go through if you were trying to join a program at Amazon or, or a private sector vendor. I mean, it is a complicated process, uh, number one. Number two, uh, when you look at um, uh, the marketing of that program, the government is limited in what it can do from a marketing perspective. So how can we work with a private sector partner, incentivize them financially to market the hell out of that program? Relying on the goodwill of American Express and Lowe's Hotels and a few others uh, is simply not going to get us the numbers we want there. And number three, when it comes to global entry, you know, right now I understand that the, the wait times for interviews are skyrocketing because one, there's demand, and two, there's the sequester. We're cutting back on the number of, uh, of customs uh, officials who can meet with these individuals. This is a great opportunity for either part-time, retired, whomever it may be, to bring them in and incorporate them into the global entry enrollment process. And that's where CBP, I think, needs greater flexibility uh, to enable them to do that. So I would, global entry has great potential. Uh, we're not going to seize that potential in the path we're on. Uh, so let, let's have an open dialogue about what other paths could get us where we need to go. I think on the, uh, on the point about biometrics, uh, I am hearing about the different approaches here, uh, using kiosks, using means of getting in, of clearing customs that would require uh, fewer officers. 
Um, I'm not overly optimistic that uh, we're going to lead the way in the use of technology at the customs checkpoint, um, but um, uh, there are certainly opportunities there, whether that's uh, with the phone. Uh, but I think even the kiosk model, akin to what airlines do, where we all go and there are 20 kiosks for four officers, uh, for four uh, uh, check-in officials, uh, that may be a good model for what could be done here. Go ahead, Isabel, and then Mike. Um, well, I, I don't have a, a great deal to add. I mean, I do think that in, in general, it's going to take sort of uh, one of each. I, I think that obviously uh, we can't continue to do business the way we're doing business now, and that is clear. Um, the use of uh, biometric identifiers and the risk-based approach, I think, really offers um, the path forward. I'm, I can't speak to whether individual technology solutions are going to work here or there. Um, I think that from my experience, um, these questions are always far more complicated than we think they are. Uh, we are transforming a, a, a legacy system um, that uh, takes time. It takes time to look at the, um, uh, the back office, if you will, uh, to, to look at how all of the uh, databases are going to work together uh, to query. Um, and I think that we are suffering some of that process, um, transformation, pain now. Uh, so I think that, 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 that we're on the right path. Um, I will say that uh, the, 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 the work together of the public and private sector, I think, is really helping to drive this forward. But at times we are, in this transformational environment, a victim of our own success. We run out and market a program and then find out that we ne can't necessarily keep up with the demand. So then, you know, we have to go back and look at what what, what that issue is about and, and solve that. Um, things, are, things are often uh, simpler in theory than they are in practice. Great, Michael. Okay, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> to your question about uh, what the private sector can do, I think I would um, sort of capture it this way. Uh, national security is an inherently governmental function. And so the private sector can only be expected to do so much. And in that sense, I think the industry uh, would oppose any additional uh, burden uh, and cost burden that's placed on the private sector uh, to do some of what you described. Passengers themselves are already paying a customs fee, an immigration fee, an agriculture and plant uh, inspection fee uh, for these various services. Um, but even if it's still coming up short, then that's where we need to look to our elected officials uh, to allocate and appropriate uh, the resources uh, that they need. Um, I don't think there are roles that we can play constructively in partnership with CBP and TSA and DHS and all the other uh, alphabet groups within the government, but I don't think that uh, the industry itself should bear uh, the overwhelming burden, uh, cost burden, when what we're talking about is a national security function in the end, and national security rightfully belongs with the federal government. That was the whole debate that took place after 9-11, uh, when there were some people who wanted to point the fingers at the airlines as if we had done something wrong. We were operating under a regime that existed at the time that those items that were carried on board those aircraft were permissible. There's a debate that just kicked off the last couple of days about whether or not some of those policies need to be revisited. Um, that's a TSA issue, not a, a Customs and Border Protection, but uh, I'm just, we're very sensitive uh, of drawing that fine line between what is rightfully our responsibility and what rightfully belongs to the federal government. And national security and admissibility, the law enforcement function of determining who should enter this country and who shouldn't, it doesn't rest with us. It, it rightfully belongs with CBP, ICE, DHS, and all the other uh, law enforcement agencies. And just to uh, Jeff's point about flexibility, one of the things that could happen that would help us tremendously uh, is if some of the work rules were changed. It's my understanding that you're either full-time or you're not. It would be very helpful if we had part-time uh, agents, agents that could rove, roam around the airports. All of us just had an experience at Los Angeles. Each of us in our particular concourses typically have our own inspection facility. Um, we paid to renovate ours at LAX uh, to clear international arriving passengers on American Airlines. Um, as of the last couple of weeks ago, uh, those were all shut down. All the inspectors are in the Tom Bradley International Terminal, so every international arriving flight at LAX 
goes to the Tom Bradley terminal, and then you go outside or get on a bus and go to your connecting terminal. A lot of people are getting left behind um, or misconnecting. Even though we have a facility right there that we paid for, we built, it's nice, it's empty right now. Fastest I've run in the last 10 years was at LAX trying to make a connection. Um, okay, uh, one more question. Anyone else from the audience? Uh, back, standing room only. Thanks. My name is Gabriel Toledo. I'm from the U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce. And Mr. Freeman, you emphasize the fact that the logistics in custom have discouraged travelers from coming to the United States. But do you also think the security measures taken by custom officers have also discouraged the coming of travelers to the U.S.? You know, I'll echo the point that Michael made before. Uh, security is job one. And uh, we learned a very, very important lesson uh, in that area. And w many of the policies uh, that we have in place are the right policies to have in place. What we need to do is balance the successes we've had on the security side with equal investments in efficiency, with equal investments in customer service, uh, with an equal commitment to not letting security become an obstacle to facilitating travel. And that's, that's the challenge that we've put forward. We've found a way to do that on the visa side where, you know, we put in place this, uh, this interview requirement. We enforced the interview requirement post 9-11, which contributed to wait time skyrocketing. We have now found a way to keep that requirement in place for many travelers, but bring down the wait times. The same can be done at Customs if Congress uh, will provide the resources necessary, if we will enable the flexibility necessary, if we effectively market and promote a program like Global Entry, the tools are there. It's not the security requirements that need to change as much as it is the commitment to facilitating and providing adequate customer service. Great. Yeah, Isabel, Michael, any other comments or closing remarks? That's it? Okay, well, once again, we're honored to have this uh, distinguished panel up here. Give them a round of applause. Thank you much. We're going to take a, uh, I'll let Stephanie do logistics and we'll get ready for our technology panel. So Stephanie, over to you. We will take a five minute break.